Today we're going to be doing some things out of the textbook. We're going to be doing discussion at the end of the class led by Jeremiah who is earning extra credit points. You can look on your syllabus and see where there are other places where you can earn extra credit points uh, that may help you along. Um, we'll begin though with watching a movie, uh, about 10 minutes of the movie. And we're going to watch the opening sequence from 10 Things I Hate About You. Uh, it's an admittedly chick flick. Um, it's a chick flick adaptation of, of Shakespeare's very masculine uh, Taming of the Shrew. And it, a lot of the themes from Shakespeare are preserved, and even some of the lines, and it's rather clever that way. But what I'm interested in is how these young people, these high school kids, socially construct their identity. Because we all do. We do things either in reaction to others or, or in response to, in order to conform to others. For example, when I was an undergraduate, when I was in high school, I'll go back that far. When I was in high school, my shtick was, and it was a very <coughs> deliberate shtick, was to wear plaid shirts and striped ties. Now, I went to an all-boys high school in the early 1960s, uh, from 1961 to 1960, or from 1963 to 1966, and, and so this was my shtick. Nobody else was doing this, and I had a little crew cut, and I was kind of geeky, but I wore plaid shirts and striped ties all the time, and I got known for this. It was part of how I constructed my identity. I also constructed my identity in part by what I did after school. I always had a job. First two years of high school, even though I was underage, I worked at my church as a janitor. After that, I worked in various places after school. And always having a job meant that I could not participate in after school extracurricular activities. But then my high school was 4,000 boys. I was kind of underweight. Um, and I tried football one year and I was a disaster. And I tried wrestling one year and I turned out I was lazy. So I went to work instead. In college, I picked up this habit that I would only write with a green Bic pen. Everybody else was using red and blue and black, and I would only use green Bic pen. So I have these notebooks from, from my college undergraduate days that are all in green. I just had to make a name for myself, and I got on I got on crusades. I was one of those kids who believed in justice. So this was 1960s. We were hippies. We were smoking the dope and, and doing all those wild mushroomy things. Only I didn't do any of that stuff. But I was on the front lines of the crusade for justice and freedom and ending the Vietnam War. And I earned the, the nickname of Crusader Rabbit, which was a cartoon character. And I still, I, there are people who still call me by that nickname. In fact, I just reconnected with, with one of them who we called Alice Dammit. Uh, and she said, Rabbit, it's so good to hear from you. I said, Damn it, it's so good to hear from you. <laughs> but that's, those are the kinds of things that we do to construct our identity. As we watch this little opening of 10 Things I Hate About You, pay attention to the ways in which these characters construct their identity within the society in which they find themselves. Let's talk a little bit about Bianca. Bianca is the younger sister. She's the pretty, kind of feminine one. How does she come up with who she is, what she should be like? What does Bianca do? Taryn? I don't know. She wants to be cool? She wants to be cool, but how does she declare her coolness? She has Skechers and a Prada, so it's, it's connected with having the right material goods for an upper class life. What does Kate think about her own upper class whiteness? Which Mr. Morgan points out to her. Impressive. Yeah, she thinks she's oppressed as a woman, and what does Mr. Morgan have to say? That she doesn't know what oppression is. She has no, she has no idea. But how has she constructed this idea that she's oppressed? 
Where does she get the idea that she's oppressed? By watching the other students and seeing how they're reacting to everyone because they're trying to conform. Right, she's watching all of these other students and how do we see her showing that she wants to be a nonconformist? What's her big act of rebellion as she comes into the high school? She rips the poster down. Mm -hmm. She rips the poster down. That has just been put up, right? So we get that from them. How about the guys? We have, we particularly have Cameron and, and the guy who's showing him around. How do they begin to construct their, their social identity? What do we find out about the, the kid who's showing Cameron around that he doesn't want known? He's a loser. He's a loser. How do, what do we mean by loser? And he's one of those nerdy types. He's one of those AV geeks, right? We, so the filmmaker sets that up real, real carefully. Right? Now he's going to, throughout the movie, he's going to try to lose that loser uh, uh, identity, but he never can. He never can. What about Miss Janie? How does she construct her social identity? What kind of a high school guidance counselor is she? Burfi? She's not really a good one. She's not a good one. Why? What do we expect a good high school counselor to do? Ashley, what do we expect a good high school counselor to do? Counsel and be there. Counsel and be there. Like when Cameron came in, not just hand him a schedule and say, scoot. What, what should she be doing? Show him around the school. She should show him around the school. She should, what? Here's a kid who's been in nine schools in five years. Okay. You got, anybody have that experience as an army brat? You get transferred around a bunch? Nine schools in five years? Are you disoriented, do you think? Would you welcome an adult who actually cared about you? Probably, probably in real life. But this adult just goes, scoot. How does she construct her identity? What is she? Is she a high school guidance counselor? What is she? Novelist. She's a novelist. Of what kind of novels? Well, not necessarily adult. She's a, she's a novelist of what, what we call in the trade bodice rippers. That is those romantic novels. That, that always get to the edge of sex, but never actually show anybody having sex. You might talk about the things that she talks about, it, but you won't go so far as to say, and then he, and describe the act of intercourse. You would, you close the curtain on it. These are, these are popular romantic fiction. Many young women will read a lot of bodice rippers in their, spare time because they're easy reading and they fill up time and they're fantasies and sure why not when that's how she pictures herself not really as a high school guidance counselor that's just kind of a side job right and then finally we have we have the character of patrick verona right how does he create his social identity and he's going to be very consistent about it how does he how does he create his social identity? Through fear, kind of. Intimidation, right? Intimidation. Is he physically intimidating? No, he's Heath Ledger. Mm -hmm. Compared huh? to the two nerds, he would be. Hmm? Compared to the other two, like, the, I guess. The right, compared to the two small guys he is, but what about compared to the jocks? What about compared to the guys on the football team? How, how does he create his intimidation? Well, we saw it there with, with the guidance counselor. It's primarily through his words, right? And then there are rumors about him, as you know, the film, there are rumors about him that he sold his kidneys for, you know, to save his brothers, and that he once ate a duck, everything but the feet and the bill, and all kinds of strange things are being told about him that are not true. So he creates some fear and intimidation. How do you create your social image? How do you create the image of yourself? What goes into you? Emily, what choices have you made that create you? I don't know if I'm 
on my hat, I guess, today helps. The hat helps. The hat helps. What does the hat say about you? I was cold. <laughs> that you were cold? What else does the hat say about Emily? She may have been cold. Anybody else have an opinion about Emily's hat? It's a stylish hat, right? It's a stylish hat. Okay. So, Stephen, how do you create your social image? What do you do? Maybe. So, what is, what is, what's that composed of? Uh, smiling, laughing, joking around. So, you're always smiling, laughing, joking around, even when you don't feel it? Just act it. You're going to act it. Okay. All right. Colton, what do you do? I guess I'm a follower. I follow my friends a lot. Okay. Well, you do some other things, too. Like, here it is. It's February 14th, and you're in shorts. I just got done working out. So you're an athlete. No, I'm not. <laughs> you work out. You know, you're, you're athletic. How's that? You're athletic. You do work out. Okay. Bobby? We've talked about this. You came, no shoes, no jacket. How does that create part of your social image? I guess it, I don't mind the cold. Okay. You don't mind the cold. Anybody else? How do you create your social image? Our textbook talks about several ways in which we create our social image. One is by the looking glass self. What do others see when they look at me? The other is by the, the way our parents have told us to be. Our parents and significant others. One of the reasons I wear black, I, I wear black a lot. Um, I used to be clergy, so that went with that. But when I was just a preteen, a cousin that I looked up to said to me, was one Sunday morning I was in an acolyte robe, which was an all black robe, and, had, my little, had the little white part over it, little white cot over it. And she said, oh, you look really good in black. And that stuck with me. So I always think like, yeah, I look good in black. So I wear a lot of black. Significant others. What have your parents said to you? What have, Megan, what have your parents said to you about how you, how you are? Um, I think we're good girls. So I, I mean, I try to be a good person, so I won't Okay. So, so our parents will say, you're a really good kid. And so we try to be really good. What have your parents said to you? Michael, what have your parents said to you? Parents and or significant others. Okay. What have they said to you about you? They think I'm shy. Okay. So they'll say to you, Michael, you're such a shy guy, you ought to, you ought to come out of your shell. Okay. Does it work? Not really. Okay. You stay shy. Yeah. Okay. Do you ever let go? Like around the team or yeah. or with buds? Yeah. How many how many guys can be around for you to let go? Well, they're good friends. It's pretty easy. But okay. But it's it's not it, you don't let go around like the whole team. Not really. It's just you're close friends within the team. Okay. Not unusual. Not unusual. Jessica, what did your parents tell you? Did they tell you anything about, did you ever hear from your parents you're not going out in that? Because you always made choices that they approved of. So, so your parents haven't really influenced you? No, they did. Like, going to school and having conversations and stuff. Okay. But you cannot, you cannot recall the ways. All right. How many of you have bought clothing just because it was the style? Everybody has. Everybody has. You buy things that are the style. That's part of media influence. How many of you have thought about dieting because you see yourself as too big? I have. 
In fact, I did die because I saw myself as too big. Too big compared to what, Ashley? Hmm? Victoria's Secret Models? Compared to Victoria's Secret Models. Well, you're as lovely as any Victoria's Secret model. Compared to what? Melody, have you ever dieted? Um, yeah, kind of. Just like compared to what society has like told us is what we should look like, I guess. Right, but has anybody from society called you up and said, Oh, by the way, Melody, you, uh, we want you to be slimmer. No. How did we get those messages? <laughs> TV. <laughs> Magazines, right? Gentlemen, what is the spring edition of Sports Illustrated that you wait for? There you go. As you think about, gentlemen, as you think about the woman with whom you are in love or will fall in love, do you want her to be a swimsuit model? Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> Will you accept her as she is? I hope so. I hope you'll learn to do that. But our self-image comes from a lot of sources. From our looking glass self, that is how we look compared to others. From the influence of parents and significant others. And then finally, from the influ influence of the mass media. All of those have a part in our building our self-image. And as we come to conform to those, we, we learn what's acceptable and what's not. And we have our difficulties or we don't. You'll find all of this in the first two pages of the DeVito text in chapter 2, in which he talks about the self. He also, though, in chapter 2, talks about <coughs> our self as having four different quadrants. Page 27. And this comes under our self-awareness. Well, let me get this open for you. find this under handouts. This is called the Joe Harry window. The Joe Harry window. A strange name for a, for a concept. The Joe Harry window was created by Joe Luft and Harry Ingham in 1969. In the late 1960s, we went through a period in, in psychology and in communication studies that was called the Human Potential Movement. And Luft and Ingham were part of that. They were out in Colorado. They had a, um, a, a human potential group where people would come to study their potential and see what they could become. And of that, their working group is, is important to us as we study how small groups function. But in general for communication, one of the most important things they did was creating this concept of the Joe Harry window. And what the Joe Harry window does is it divides our self into four parts. Now, there have been lots of attempts to divide the self into parts. For example, in the church we've often talked about body and soul. In psychology, Freud talked about ego, id, and superego. Like those things, if you were to take us apart, if you were to dissect me, would you find a soul? No. If you were to take my brain apart, would you find a place marked ego and a place marked superego and a place marked id? No. 
These are concepts to try and help us understand what's going on inside of our heads, and so it is with the Joe Harry window. We are not four selves. In fact, it's better to think of this as four quadrants of self-disclosure. First, there is an open self. And you'll find this in the book. Second, a blind self. Third, a hidden self. And fourth, an unknown self. The known self is that part of me that everybody knows. Not just that I know, but everybody knows. What all is in that part of me that everybody knows? Uh, well, that may not be. You might make that distinction. What, else, what What's known to everybody or just about everybody? I don't hide away. That I'm a professor. That I like to talk. That I'm not shy. Right? Or at least I don't seem to be shy. My name. Known to most everybody. In fact, I have people I don't know calling me up and calling me by name and asking me to give them money. Okay? That's what's in the open self. The blind self, that's what I don't know about me, but you do. I don't know about me, but you do. Sometimes those are accidents. Have you ever come out of a bathroom trailing toilet paper on your heel? If you've never done that, someday you will. Have you ever come, you ever come with your shirt hanging out the back? Or a sign pasted on your back? Things that you can't see that are behind you. Those are all unknown. But everybody else sees them. Sometimes as you get older, you want to make sure that there are other things that everybody else might see that you don't want them to see, gentlemen. Just remember. Yes? You understand me? The things that you don't want everyone to see that you might forget? Okay. Then there's the hidden me. These are the things that are known to me, but not to you. And sometimes those hidden things are things that you should not know. They may be gross, or they may be my private business. And sometimes those hidden things are things I don't want you to know, such as my private agendas when we're in a group meeting. Whether or not I snore. <laughs> Finally, there is a quadrant that they call the unknown quadrant. And that's the part of me that I don't know and you don't know. Mostly it's the part of me that is consistent of, consists of potentialities. 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 James, can you play the piano? No. You ever tried? Yeah. Okay, then you would know, right? Okay. Jeremiah, you ever tried playing the piano? I've tried. What about what about the trumpet? I've tried. Oh, I give you credit. I give you credit. Celia. You ever tried the guitar? Tried. <laughs> Didn't go well. How about, how about uh, <laughs> clarinet? Mm -hmm. Never tried clarinet? Yeah. Okay. Think you'd be a good clarinet player? I have no idea. Exactly. And neither <laughs> do we. That's that fourth quadrant. The unknown self. Okay? So, open is known to all. Blind, unknown to me, hidden, known only to me, unknown, unknown by all. Now what's desirable? As we are working with other people, we want to open more of our open self. That's how you become friends. 
you learn more about those people that become your friends. If you only stay at the surface with those people around you, and all you know is their name and where they're from and their major, you don't know very much. And your friendship is pretty shallow. As your friendship deepens, you begin to learn lots of things about them that might be hidden. Like when they got hurt, who they don't like, who they do like, what their capacities are. All of those things are parts of the hidden self that can be opened to, the, to others. So we want to decrease our hidden self while increasing our public or open self because that makes for transparency in relationships and it makes better relationships. The more transparent we can be with others, the deeper and better our relationships can be with others. Remember, this comes out of the human potential movement. Thus, the, what we're looking for is to increase our potential as human beings. Second, we want to decrease our blind self. We really do want to know things that we're not doing as well as we might in order that we can do them better. You know, you guys have turned in a first set of papers and I've turned them back to you with extensive comments, but no grade because the comments are more important than the grade. You're going to rework one of the first four papers for a grade, but you'll have some idea, you'll have a better idea of things that you can do to make your writing better. That's decreasing your blind self. Because if you knew already the things that you have trouble with in your writing, you wouldn't do them, right? The coach doesn't let you play the same play the same way every time if you're playing it wrong. The coach is going to step in and he's going to correct, or she's going to correct what you're doing. If they don't, you're not going to get to be a better player. That's decreasing your blind self, because if you knew what you were doing wrong, you wouldn't do it. Or at least you would try not to avoid that. You become a better human being. You learn to deal with parts of yourself that you don't particularly like. You learn, you show your openness to other human beings and their insights. Third, we want to decrease the unknown self. Remember, this is human potential movement. We want to decrease that, that quadrant of us that's all potentiality. Now, some of you have in regards to piano. I have heard from several of you that you tried piano and it didn't work. That's fine. What else <coughs> haven't you tried? What else haven't you tried that you really should try? When I was an undergraduate, my undergraduate degree did not require me to take upper division mathematics. I stopped mathematics in high school with trigonometry, so pre-calc. I never found out if I was capable of doing higher level mathematics. I never challenged myself to do that. I, could, I escaped. It was too easy. If you don't accept the challenges, that hidden self, that unknown self rather, that unknown self can never grow. Accept the challenges of things that you don't know how to do. Now, on the other hand, you don't want to accept every challenge in a high stakes fashion. Right? If you accept every challenge in a high stakes fashion, you're going to fail some. There's no doubt about it. You're going to fail some. And if it's all high stakes, you do have trouble. Okay? So Joe Harry Window last tells us, decrease the unknown self, use more of your potential. What's the point of all of this? The point is to become a transparent self, insofar as that's possible. 
And insofar as it helps relationship and aids in group functioning and enables the individual to maximize potential. Over the, over the break, I hope, we're going to have our little break here, and I hope that over this break, I'll be able to put together a little video, put it online as a supplement for Thursday when we won't have class. Maybe about 10 minutes of talking about places and times when you don't want to self-disclose. Um, I think it's, may, it's kind of Dutch uncle talk. You probably know most of these places and times, but maybe I'll talk about those. And it won't be real long. Okay? Any questions about the Joe Harry window? This will be on our quiz. This will be on our quiz. Okay. All right, guys. Well, we come now to, we've talked about self-awareness, the Joe Harry window. And we come now on page 28 to talk about self-esteem. <coughs> Jeremiah is going to lead us in this discussion. How, how ethnocentric did you turn out to be? <laughs> Which means what? You're very, not very? Not very, okay. All right, Mr. Scott, there you go. How'd you turn out? Low. Okay, very low. Cecilia, how'd you turn out? Very low. Very low? Yeah. Okay, now Taryn, we'll come back to you. I got low, too. You scored pretty low? Yeah. All right, we got Bumphrey's trying to <laughs> avoid the shot. How'd you score? Uh, How did you score? Uh, low, high? High. High, okay. <laughs> Scored low. All right. There's a disagreement. Mr. Reynolds, how did you score? Uh, I scored low. Okay. Anybody score high ethnocentrism? That is a feeling that our, your culture is the best culture and other cultures are just wrong? That's, that's the meaning of ethnocentrism. My culture is the best culture and other cultures are just wrong. Not my culture is the best culture for me. But my culture is the best culture. How many of you have been? How many of you have been to totally foreign cultures where you could not speak the language, you could not read the signs, you did not know what was going on? Okay. Where did you go, James? Where in Europe? Did you go to France? Okay. Okay. Cecilia, where did you go? So you did Europe. You did Europe with this with a group. How many of you have been to Asia? How many of you have ever been to Asia? Anybody? Anybody? Ever been to Asia? How many of you have ever been to a Chinatown? A real Chinatown like New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles. Been to a Chinatown. How the ducks? Have you been by the restaurant and seen the duck? Like the duck hanging in the window. Like the duck hanging in the window. And what happens to the duck's neck as it's hanging in the window? It stretches. Oh, there you go. You see, when we ask you questions about it, you go, yeah, I'm pretty culturally open. And we are. We are culturally open. You guys are much more open than, than I ever was. But when you get to specifics, like a really strange culture, like a Chinese culture where the food is hanging out and the duck is just hanging until the neck gets real long, you go, ooh, that's kind of, ooh. Or a squat toilet. Do you, do you understand what a squat toilet is? A squat toilet means that there is a hole in the floor. There is a hole in the floor. There are places on either side to put your feet. And that's how you take care of your business. Where is that? They have them in Romania. Yeah. They're, they're all over China. We don't call it a squat toilet. We call it we call it a latrine, but it, but it's all over it's all over Japan, China. I know Asia still loves them. They think the Asians think they're great. You go to you go out you go out for dinner in Japan. Everything is brought to you raw. You eat a lot of raw food. You eat a lot of raw seafood. Some, some stuff is baked, is, is tempura. It's a very different culture. When you go there, 
all of a sudden your ethnocentrism comes out because you like food that you know what it is. You like food, you know how it's been prepared. All right, last thing for today. Last thing for today. We're going to be going on to chapter 2 tomorrow, or Tuesday rather. Uh, there will be some stuff online Thursday, but the class will not meet as a class. I will be in the hospital on Thursday. I go to the hospital on Wednesday. If you want to come visit me, make sure you don't have a cold. You're welcome to come. I'll be at Salina Regional Hospital on the fourth floor. Um, and I probably will be a little bit out of my mind, more so than usual. Uh, but we will, we will start on Chapter 2. Jeremiah is going to lead us in a discussion of self-esteem. Uh, the Chapter 1 post-quiz is open. Take it by 11 o'clock tonight. Topics on the quiz. There are ten quest or eight questions on this quiz. Eight questions on this quiz. Two are short answer. In other words, you write a little bit. And six are yeah, six are um, uh, multiple choice. So there are only eight questions. You have fifteen minutes. It's a timed test. You have 15 minutes. That's why I told you, Megan, if, if it drives you crazy, let me know. Okay? If you have a problem with doing online testing, you've never done online testing, or you have anxieties about online testing, take a deep breath, do this one. If it doesn't work, we will find another way to test your knowledge. You can use your book. You can have your book with you. Okay? You can have your book with you. What's on the test? There are questions about the model of communication, questions about competence, communication competence, we talked about that, questions about the principles of communication. You remember I said, I'm going to give you questions on James does such and such, what's the principle? What's the purpose of his communication? James tells a joke, right? Ronald, you're a good joke teller. I can tell. You're a better joke teller than the other James. Oh, absolutely. I can tell. I can tell. Uh, what's the purpose of his communication? To play. To play. Very good. Okay. You got the idea. There's a little bit about critical thinking, about evidence. Um, a little bit on cultural uh, awareness, mindfulness, and ethnocentrism. Now, there are more questions in the question bank than you will be asked. So no two of you will get the same questions at the same time. It automatically just randomizes questions, okay, and out they come. You are welcome to take your notes, the PowerPoints, and your textbook. But remember, you have only 15 minutes, so if you've never read the textbook or looked at the PowerPoints or looked at your notes, you don't have time during the, test, during the quiz session. It's only 10 points. It's only 10 points. And this is the first quiz you, you've taken from me, so you don't know how ambiguous and deliberately misleading my questions and answers are. Which means you're giving us a test to shoot us in the dark. A little bit. A little bit in the dark. But we'll see how you come out. Really? We'll see how you come out. Okay? So don't, don't stress. Don't stress. Take it, take it easy. Study. Do well. We'll see you guys Tuesday when we talk about Chapter 2 and self-esteem.